Well, good morning again. Um, as I said earlier, we are continuing our sermon series, Meals with Jesus, as we look through the Gospel of Luke. We're actually finishing our sermon series this Sunday. Next week, we'll dive into Exodus, as we'll be in there for uh, a good amount of time. Back into the expository preaching groove, um, which I'm excited about. Um, but Jay will talk more about our sermon series in Exodus next week. Um, like I said, we're in uh, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10 this morning. And I know we've just prayed, but would you pray with me that we will invite the Spirit to help us understand his word uh, as we're together this morning. Father, your word is true, is living and active, and we know that it is shaping us, informing us, even now in this moment. Lord, we trust that your Spirit is the one who will be with us this morning to give us understanding to your word, that he'll reveal all things about Christ Jesus in your word, this morning, and that your spirit will bring conviction to us so that we can put off our old self and be renewed in the spirit of our mind so that we put on the new self that you've uh, created us to live into. I pray also, Father, that your spirit will help me preach faithfully with the appropriate affections that are required of this text. Father, I pray that my words would be gracious and good for the building up of your people here this morning. But above all else, Lord, help me to follow your spirit so that Christ will be exalted in my preaching. And Father, if I've asked for too little this morning, would you do far more than what I've asked for? Be with us now. This time, this place is yours. Do with it as you see, as you deem fit, Lord. As well, these things in Christ's name. Amen. I want to label the message this morning, as was mentioned in verse 10, that he's come to save the lost. He's come to save the the lost. When I was younger, I think I've mentioned this before, but something that I've always thought about doing was joining the Coast Guard. And I can't help but think about all the times I thought it'd be cool to be a rescue swimmer, the the guys that jump out of the helicopter into the deepest and the choppiest of waters to save people. There are people that risk their lives all so that they could save the boaters and the kayakers that are lost out at sea. Growing up, I watched show after show and movie after movie of all the ways that the Coast Guard would rescue people and jump into the water to save them. I remember story after story of how people thought they would be lost at sea forever, but their lives were saved by a man who did everything he could to save them. In all these stories, the victims would recall seeing a bright light coming in from the horizon, and when all of a sudden a big orange helicopter would come over them. And as they see this helicopter, uh, a man jumps out of it and starts to swim over to them. And they could say that as a swimmer was coming to them, he would stay with them until they were brought safely up into the helicopter. And it's once they made it back to dry land that they told story after story of how this one man changed their life forever. I mention this because a rescue swimmer can enter into the most impossible situations to seek out the lost and to save them. And in a higher, heavier, and holier way, this is what's taking place in the first 10 verses of chapter 19. Here in Jesus' last public meal, he's showing us that he is the man who has come to do the impossible and save those who are spiritually lost from God. I believe this is the main idea of our text, and if I could summarize it in one short sentence, it would be that Jesus has come to save the lost. This is the mission of Jesus' ministry, and we'll see that the lost are saved through three distinct things. We'll first see how the lost are saved after seeing. We'll then see how the lost are saved through staying. And finally, we'll see how the lost are saved through changing. We begin by first looking at how the lost are saved after seeing. Look at verses 1 through 4. It says that he entered Jericho, or Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able to because of the crowd, since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus, since he was about to pass that way. Luke begins in verse 1 by saying that Jesus entered into Jericho, and he was passing through. Jesus was coming from an area between Samaria and Galilee, and he was heading towards Jerusalem. And Jericho was a city that was on the path to Jerusalem. But before Jesus came to Jericho, we're told in chapter 18 that Jesus spent time in a village talking about God's kingdom. 
He was speaking to religious leaders, and he says that when God's kingdom comes, it will come suddenly. He then goes on to say that God's, God's ultimate justice will come with the coming kingdom, and only those who are humble like children will enter in to his kingdom. Then in verses 18 through 27 of chapter 18, Jesus speaks to a young, rich ruler who asks him how he can enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus replies by saying that he must sell all his possessions and distribute them to the poor. The rich young ruler, not wanting to let go of his money, his great amount of wealth, he runs away saddened because of what Jesus says. And then after Jesus sees this, he responds by saying, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Upon hearing this, those around Jesus asked him, who then can be saved? To which Jesus replied, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. This serves as a backdrop of our text as Jesus now continues to walk towards Jerusalem and enters into Jericho. Luke in verses 2 through 4 shifts our focus from Jesus to a man named Zacchaeus. We're told that he was a chief tax collector and that he was rich. The word there for rich means that Zacchaeus had an abundance of material wealth. This makes sense because tax collectors were often corrupt. That as the Jews would pay taxes to the Roman government, they would then take some of that tax money and use it for themselves to make themselves wealthy. So Zacchaeus, being a chief tax collector, would exhort large sums of money from all the other tax collectors to make himself wealthy. This corruption and greed are quite, iro- are quite ironic because Zacchaeus' name actually means righteous one. But in these verses, Luke doesn't just tell us about Zacchaeus' moral character. He also tells us about his physical appearance. Luke mentions that Zacchaeus was too short to see over the crowd as Jesus Pass by. Now, someone that's also vertically challenged, like Zacchaeus, I can understand the struggle that he had of trying to look over the crowds. Maybe Zacchaeus was trying to stand on his tippy toes, seeing over the heads of the crowd, but he couldn't. And as he's sitting in the back on the streets of Jericho, maybe he was trying to jump up over and over again to see Jesus, but it didn't work. So Zacchaeus, not wanting to give up, he then decides to run ahead of Jesus and he climbs up into a sycamore tree. I can imagine Zacchaeus doing that. He's being like a monkey, climbing up limb by limb, branch by branch, pulling leaves away to see Jesus, even if it was for a brief second. Friends, can you feel the excitement that Zacchaeus had for Jesus? Zacchaeus was so eager to see Jesus that he did whatever it took to get one glimpse of him. Maybe Zacchaeus heard about how Jesus had just healed the sight of a blind man that he was now able to see uh, as he was sitting on the outskirts of Jericho. This is who Zacchaeus wanted to see, the powerful Jesus who had the ability to help people regain sight. As we think about that, Family, are you eager like Zacchaeus to see Jesus? If you say you're excited for Jesus, are you willing to do whatever it takes to see him? And if I can press in just a little bit further, are you willing to see Jesus with other people? And what I mean by that, it's not just that uh, we should um, help other people see Jesus, but we should run after Jesus and run after people, that we come in together. This is why the author of Hebrews in chapter 10, he says we are to draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And as we pursue Christ, we are to come together to serve one another to love and good works, encouraging one another and not neglecting to meet as the habit of some. Our running after and seeing of Jesus isn't something that we just do by ourselves. It's something that we are to do with each other as we commit to our church family. This is why we highlight celebrations of discipleship, because we see people pursuing Jesus together, and that's something to celebrate. But maybe you're here this morning, and even though there's a part of you that wants to see Jesus, there's so much blocking you from seeing him. Maybe it's church hurt, or maybe you don't really know who Jesus is, and you don't know what to do with him. Or friend, if either of those things describe you, I wanted to encourage you to still do whatever you can to see Jesus. I say this because God has the ability to remove any barriers that prevent us from seeing him. 
And as he removes those barriers, he reveals his true self to us so that we can understand who he actually is. But it's not just that we see the true character of Jesus as we look after him, but we also see that he actually stays with us as we see him. Look at verses 5 through 7. It says, When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. And all who saw it began to complain, he's gone to stay with a sinful man. After Zacchaeus sits in a sycamore tree, Luke tells us that Jesus comes to it. He looks up to the tree and he begins to speak to Zacchaeus. Jesus tells Zacchaeus to hurry to come down, for it's necessary for him to stay at Zacchaeus' house that day. What's interesting here is that the word that Luke uses for necessary, he uses in other places in his gospel in in the book of Acts to talk about divine necessity. In other words, it's a way of saying that God must do something and there's no other way around it. This word is used by Jesus when he says that the Christ must suffer and then rise again on the third day after he dies. God deemed it necessary for Christ to suffer, and God also deemed it necessary that Jesus must stay at Zacchaeus' house. But something else worth noting here is that Jesus' statement says that he needs to stay at at Zacchaeus' house, even though we just read before that Jesus was just supposed to pass through. It's interesting here that even though Jesus was on a mission from God that he was supposed to go to Jerusalem, he still made it a point to stay at Zacchaeus' house. I just want to say here, family, that Jesus does not mind being interrupted. Jesus is never in a hurry. He's never worried about missing an appointment, and he's never going to be late. He's always right on time. And that's why the saints used to sing he's an on-time God. That he may not come when you want him, but he's always going to show up right on time. God's characters that are showing up exactly when you need him to. It's not just that God will show up on time, but he's wanting to stay as long as he deems necessary, and he won't leave us until the moment is right. So family, in those moments when it seems like God is just passing on by, remember that his timing is still perfect, that he's just waiting for the right moment to look at you and to stay with you. But also notice what the crowds are saying about Jesus. In verse 7, Luke tells us that the crowds begin to complain that Jesus is staying at the house of Zacchaeus, a sinner. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Everyone knew about his corruption, and everyone wanted to avoid him. The crowds knew that being in Zacchaeus' presence would ruin their very reputation, so even entering into his house would be social death. But Jesus, in showing that God's kingdom was that of outcasts and those who are often rejected, wanted to spend time with Zacchaeus, the sinner. Family, this is an important thing for us to understand. Jesus didn't come to spend time with people who are worried about being put together or having the right social, social image. Instead, Jesus has come with, uh, to be with us and to be with sinners, those who realize that they are in need of a Savior. This is why Jesus wants to stay at Zacchaeus' house. And I hope that's an encouragement to us because Jesus isn't afraid of our sin. If I can linger here for a second, there's no sin that's too vile or too taboo that Jesus doesn't want to be near. No matter what you've seen, no matter who you used to run with, and no matter what you do, Jesus still wants to stay with you. Because Jesus isn't afraid of your sin, he'll come to the most intimate parts of you and your sin. Jesus will show up your house, he'll come through the front door and stay in your messy room. That's where he wants to be. That's where he wants to stay. And it isn't just that Jesus stays there for a brief moment, but he stays there permanently. This is why Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians that in Christ, that you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation when you believed. Christ will always stay with us because he sealed himself inside of us. No matter what your past sin was, Jesus has moved into your neighborhood and he started to set up shop in your house. And he did that at the moment you believed in him and he will stay with you forever. This is good news because Jesus stays with us sinners. But in knowing that, family, are we making time to stay with Jesus? Jesus. 
Are you seeking to spend time with him through reading your Bible and through praying? Are you eager to listen to his voice and speak to him? Our relationship with Christ works both ways, and if he's making time to spend with us, we certainly need to make time spending with him. When the lost are saved through staying, they find the lost are saved by changing. Look at verses 8 through 10. It says, But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor, Lord, and if I've exhorted, extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today salvation has come, has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. The crowd was complaining that Jesus was staying with a sinful man, but it seems as if Zacchaeus was unfazed by the crowd. After climbing down the tree and welcoming Jesus joyfully, he says that he'll give half of his possessions to the poor, and he'll pay back four times over all that he's extorted from people. Notice here the radical change that has occurred in Zacchaeus. Instead of living a life that's marked by greed and dishonest gain, Zacchaeus is making restitution or making amends for his sins. But he isn't just making up for his past sins, he's going far beyond what was required of him. In the Levitical law, it said that whenever we are aware of our sin of dishonest gain or stealing from people, we give that amount plus 20%, so 1.2 times the original amount. But what Zacchaeus is doing is he's doing four times the original amount. I know tax season was just upon us, so we probably gave the government money, the IRS money. But can you just imagine taking that payment, multiplying it by four, and then multiplying that by over hundreds of people? That's how much money Zacchaeus was willing to give up for the sake of his sins. This is in total contrast to the rich young ruler of chapter 18. When Jesus told the ruler to sell everything he had to give to the poor, the ruler ran away, it's saddened because of the cost that Jesus gave him. But Zacchaeus, he realized that no cost was too great to follow Jesus. And how does Jesus respond to this radical change? He says that salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house. Friends, let me just say here that salvation only comes to those who truly repent. Repentance is the act of turning away from sin and turning towards God. It's a heart response to the Holy Spirit's conviction of our sin. Let me also say that conviction is when the Holy Spirit shows us that we don't measure up to the standard that God has set before us. And as we see, as we're convicted of that sin, we see just how disobedient and careless we are toward the things of God. But the good news is that God doesn't just leave us alone in our conviction. That God, in the riches of his unending grace, has also given us his Holy Spirit to regenerate us, to turn us around and give us the strength, wisdom, and courage to turn away from sin and choose righteousness. It may be impossible for a rich man to repent, to sell all of his possessions and enter into the kingdom of God on his own. But the good news is that with God, he will powerfully work within us to do the impossible out of his own strength and not our own. That's God's grace for us. And it's God's grace that radically changed the heart of Zacchaeus, and in verse 8 is the evidence of that heart change. But God doesn't just redirect us from our past sin. He also guides us to resist future sin. If I can put it another way, that God, through his Holy Spirit, directs us through a supernatural detour that guides us across, around the old street with the potholes and the ensnarements of old sin so that we avoid it altogether. This is why Paul tells us in his first letter to the Corinthians that God is faithful, that he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with temptation he will also provide the way out so that you may be, may be able to bear it. Family, as you face temptation, remember that God is faithful to give you the way out, that he's faithful to walk you through that and give you the power that you need to resist temptation through his spirit. This is what it means for God to be faithful, and this is what it means for God to deliver us out of our temptation, to continue to cling to him and trust him. But getting back to verse 9, Jesus says that not only salvation has come to Zacchaeus' his house, but he's also a son of Abraham. Here, Jesus is referring back to the covenant promise that God made to Abraham back in Genesis 17. And there in the covenant, God told Abraham that he will establish my covenant between me and you, 
and your offspring after you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant. And not only that, but he will give you, or give Abraham and his offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God's promise to Abraham was that he would not only be Abraham's God, but Abraham would enter into the promised land, and his uh, descendants after him would also enter into the promised land, which was an earthly foretaste for God's eternal kingdom. And the promise is that they, God's, or Abraham's descendants will enter into an everlasting kingdom. And now back in chapter 19, Luke is explaining that as Abraham's son, Zacchaeus is also receiving this covenant promise that he will receive the reward of entering into God's kingdom, that God will be his God, and he will be God's people. God can do the impossible and change the hearts of those who are lost. He does all this so that he can save them. So family, in knowing that, who is that one person that he thinks impossible to save? As that person comes to mind, will you commit to praying for them, trusting that God truly can do the impossible? And just as Jess said, that as God's word is powerful, will you consider reading the gospel of Mark with that person that came to mind, trusting that God will open up an opportunity to allow his word to go forth, to plant a seed that will bear fruit later in life. And as you do that, as you trust God with that opportunity, you might be surprised at what he can do. And you may be asking yourself, Justin, you spend a lot of time explaining what happens when people are saved or when the lost are saved. But how do you know the lost can actually be saved? Friend, we look at verse 10 with me. Here Jesus says that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Here Jesus uses the title Son of Man as a a way to often refer to himself. It's a reference back to Daniel chapter 7 where the prophet Daniel sees a vision of someone like the Son of Man or a prophet coming down from the clouds of heaven and approaching God himself, the Ancient of Days. And as the Son of Man was being escorted towards God, he received dominion and glory in an everlasting kingdom made up of people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. This shows the divinity of Jesus, for God himself can enter, only God himself can enter into the Father's presence and receive glory. So Jesus, being God, has the authority to gather into God's kingdom people from every tribe, nation, and tongue that exists here on earth. And as the Son of Man, as the greatest of all prophets, Jesus, who came down from glory, will be able to seek those who are lost as he's proclaiming the kingdom of God. I was thinking about it earlier this week, but it's rather fitting that we finished our Meals with Jesus series with verse 10. I say that because this one verse not only summarizes this section of chapter 19, but it summarizes all of Luke's gospel and actually summarizes all of Scripture. All scripture shows us that Jesus is the one who has come to seek out and to save the lost. But if I can circle back to the very beginning of Luke's gospel, we can say with absolute certainty that Jesus will do this. But how do we know that this is true? Back in chapter 18 of Luke's gospel, Jesus says that everything that is written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. And as I dwell on what Jesus says, I can't help but think about what the prophet Zechariah said in chapter 8. That there is God speaking about rebuilding Jerusalem, the holy city. He says, Though it may seem impossible to the remnant of this people in those days, it should also seem impossible to me. I will save my people from the land of the east and the land of the west. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people, and I will be their God. I can't help but think about what the prophet Ezekiel records of God saying in chapter 34 when he says, I myself will search my flock and look for them. Just as a shepherd looks for his scattered sheep, I will seek the lost, bring back the strays, bandage the injured, and strengthen the weak. I can't help think about what the prophet Isaiah says in the 53rd chapter when he says that all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all turned everyone to his own way. But even when we've all lost our loss and fallen away from God, as we wandered away because of our sin, Isaiah continues to write about God's chosen servant. And in that 53rd chapter, he says, the servant was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. 
and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Family, we know that Jesus' divine mission is to seek out and to save the lost, and we know that he will surely do this because everything the prophet said about him, the Son of Man, will be fulfilled. Jesus will certainly seek out his lost sheep. He'll certainly bring the lost back into his sheepfold, and he'll certainly heal the wounded. We know that the lost will be saved as they see him and as they stay with him and are changed by him because Jesus has already borne the penalty for their sin. And it's through his very wounds that the lost are healed to be brought back to God, to stand in his righteousness and receive the eternal promise that God promised Abraham and the rest of his descendants. This is the mission of Jesus, and his mission is almost complete as we eagerly await his second coming. It's on that day when he comes again that we'll see just how many of the lost Jesus has gathered unto himself. And as we stand in God's kingdom, we'll be able to hear of all the ways of how they saw Jesus, how they were changed by him, and how they live with him forever. This is our future hope, and this is the direction of the Christian life, to be in the presence of God for all eternity, knowing that Jesus brought us in when we were lost. Several years ago, Goodness, it's like five years ago now. Um, I led a mission trip to Manchester in the United Kingdom. And during that trip, there wasn't a place I was large enough for all of us to stay in, so we were split into smaller groups that were dispersed throughout the city. This is where we'd sleep, and in the morning, we'd come back to one central location where the church met. And one particular day, my teammate and I took an Uber to get from the house that we were staying at to get to the church. I gave the Uber driver the address of the place we were supposed to meet at, and we started driving towards it. Something to know about the UK is that their mailing addresses look very, very different than ours. The zip codes are like letters and numbers. The addresses and the street names seem to all run together. It's very easy, as I found out, that you can mix up the addresses of where you're supposed to go in Manchester. So as we're riding in in the back of the Uber, my teammate begins to look around. He notices that all the things that are moving around us are very different from what we're used to seeing. And as the minutes go by, he turns to me and asks what the address was that I gave to the driver. And so I showed him, and as he looks at it, he tells me that I put in the wrong address, and that we're going to the total opposite side of the city where we're supposed to go. So then my friend gave the driver the correct address, and he saved us from getting lost from a place that we've never been before. It was in that moment that I realized, my friend realized just how lost that I was. So instead of letting things pass by, he sought me out in my wandering, and he came in at the right time to save me from myself, and they put us back in the right direction as we went to the place we're supposed to go. Family, this is what Jesus did for us. That he looked down and saw us as we wandered away from God, that he sought us out at the right moment as he left his throne in heaven and came down to earth in the likeness of man. And as Jesus walked on the earth, he did whatever it took to save the lost, even to the point of hanging on a tree so that we no longer had to climb up the tree. And even though he died for three days, he rose from the dead and ran ahead of us, preparing the way as we enter into heaven, into God's eternal kingdom, to stand before the Father in his throne. This is how God is able to do the impossible. This is how God is able to save even the rich man. And this is how God is able to save even us. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your Son, whom you sent to come to seek out and save the lost. Lord, we pray now that we would know you more deeply and how you have saved us from ourselves, that you saved us in our wandering, that you bring us back to your sheepfold, that you will heal us, and you will help us to stand in perfect righteousness on that great day. Lord, we pray now that you help us to see you more clearly, that as we continue to worship you and serve you, not only in this moment this morning, but throughout this week, Lord, you will help us to know how you are able to do the impossible and to save the lost. Help us to know how to live that out in our lives. May your word come quickly to our minds as we engage with the lost. And may we point to the future hope that we have in Christ Jesus and him alone. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing this morning.